environmental psychology, criminal minds, and how all of that has to do with interior design. Mind blown. You'll have to listen to the episode to find out what we're talking about. This is Susan and Paul from Cadillac Homes taking over the Wingnut Social Podcast for Darla. She has left us here in charge. Yeah, she's actually out of the world right now. She's actually in space. So um, she will be back uh, sometime soon. And while she's gone, we have been talking to Smith Asahu, who is super interesting. She has super interesting background, takes on all kinds of projects, multifamily, single family, has studied environmental psychology, put that into her design business, is building a business on her own. Lots of good stuff to share. Yeah, she sounds like an underachiever like myself. So, you know, you should stay tuned and listen because she's got a lot of good insight. Welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you. Um, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Smita Sahu. I am the creative uh, director and founder of Asaya Design. Asaya Design is a boutique interior design architecture practice. We are based in Chicago and super excited to be on this uh, podcast. This is my first podcast ever, so couldn't be with better people. Oh, so fun. And this is our first time guest hosting, so this is going to be fun for all of us. <laughs> Can you elaborate a little bit on what, um, you know, the type of projects maybe you take on or what you do specifically? You know, is there a specific, you know, every designer has a, a certain wheelhouse that they're kind of in. So do you want to maybe explain that to us? Absolutely. So Asaya Design was founded in 2020. So we are new, but we have... Uh, Fortunately, we have grown and we are expanded. So we are known to do a diverse range of projects. So starting from single family homes to multifamily projects and also mixed use commercial projects. So at this moment, we are privileged to have uh, clients, some high end clients here in Chicago working with Sterling Bay, you know, very reputed developer, so that's one end of the spectrum. But also, we are working with small boutique homeowners uh, here in Chicago, both in downtown and in suburbs. So we have a wide range of projects, and everything is exciting because each and every project type influences each other. So very thrilled that in like the span of two years, we are able to expand so much, and we are continuing to grow. So I, I love that it's such a broad range that you've got all these different types of projects. Um, I do have another question about your background and how you got in. But first, what is your favorite type of project to work on? Do you prefer the smaller residential? Do you like the you know, ones that have more commercial? Do you have a preference on the ones that you personally prefer to work on? No. So, you know, it's like asking which is your favorite child. So right. you know, they all have their challenges and excitement and personalities. So that would be my answer because like the big commercial mixed use projects, uh, you're working with a bigger team. You're working with, you know, actually sometimes two or three design teams are working together. So that's a different dynamics and you're learning from each and every other design team of how how their style of working is. So that's one level of excitement. And then also the developers and the the, the budget and the, the whole project is much more bigger and like much more uh, big scale. Right. But at the same time, when you're working with small homeowner projects, uh, you know, you're working intimately with a family. So you have to kind of understand, you know, either the couple or, you know, even if a single person, their personal taste. And as a designer, you're kind of understanding what their personal taste is and how you can elevate or how you can help them achieve what they want to do. So that's a whole different level of, uh, you know, work style. And you have to, like, quickly adapt yourself that it's not only like your style you have to understand that they have some aspirations and dreams and that's why they bring you on board so you have to respect that but at the same time they can go a little too far and you have to say okay no you know reel back you know this is what you want but you know trust me this is how you would not like if you go this route and this is what you need to do so, uh, yeah, so I hope that, uh, you know, answered my question. And they, and they both actually influence each other, uh, you know, understanding a big scale, uh, you know, project and how that impacts budget timeline. But then those kind of uh, disciplined methodology you bring into a small single family home project and they, they help. So, um, yeah, that's, that, that would be my answer. So I kind of give you a very diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, you know, as you were saying it, I think I might give the same answer. So I can't, she, I can't she ask she you she too would. much for that, right? Because when you're doing a project, they are, you know, they are all, all your babies. And how did you get, like get in, into the field? Because you're doing architecture, you're doing interior design, you're doing 
a range of projects. You know, your company is, you know, on the younger side, which is amazing. So what made you go, you know, go into this field and what kind of led you down the path um, that you're on now? Mm -hmm. So my background is architecture and interior design. So I have a bachelor's in architecture from India. And then I did my master's in interior design in University of Florida. So I'm a gator. So the room looks like a gator. (laughs) 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 It was not intentional at all. Um, But then I also have a focus in environmental psychology. So that's understanding how humans interact with built environment and, you know, how it impacts everything. So that's yeah. kind of my passion. And the reason I started and branched out in 2020, and I know uh, to be even more specific, I started my company July 4th, 2020. So that's like Independence Day. Love but that. for me, uh, it was independence of mindset, independence of being a female-owned, minority-owned business owner. And then also, if you if you remember, 2020 was also the year of change, radical change everywhere, mm-hmm. like politics. Um, you know, philosophically everywhere. So I decided to like build a company where we want to not only just do different type of design projects, but also the way we do a business, the kind of projects we go after, the kind of people we hire, um, also kind of like uh, symbolizes that, uh, you know, that value system. So for me to be a woman-owned business leader and a minority-owned is very important, and we need more of us, and we need to, and it's, I mean, I have a lot of hardships, but I'm very proud to say that, uh, you know, I, I fail, I get up, and I keep going, and and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's very exciting for me. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And I think, you know, other women seeing, you know, other women in the business and in leadership positions, it's super important because then they see you and then you inspire them to say, okay, she's doing that. I can do that too. So as you've been building your business, if you were, you know, speaking to another woman who's maybe thinking about, you know, should I start my own business? Should I go off on my own? What this is kind of two questions. <laughs> um, what kind of advice would you give her and what has been impactful for you in, you know, in building your business and finding success as, you know, as a newer business? Mm-hmm. I think the first step starts with believing in yourself. Because if you don't trust yourself and believe, you may have the best marketing material, you may have the best resource and contact, but if you don't do that, then everybody will be like, oh, are you sure you want to do this? So that, that's the first step. It's like once you have uh, decided that this is my path, so no matter what, I'm just going to move forward, then everything else is kind of aligns. And the challenge, and I was just reading this article this morning that successful entrepreneurs are not who have not seen failure. Successful entrepreneurs are ones who have failed, picked themselves up, and kept going, kind of like a kid when they start to learn how to walk. They're constantly falling, but they never give up. They don't say that, hey, you know, I'm not going to try. So having the same kid mentality of like never giving up and eventually they'll walk, that's that's very important because you may be a fantastic designer and you may have all the resources, but if you don't have the tenacity to keep going, then you you will not, like, so I have to me, confidence, tenacity, and never give up attitude is very important. Uh, that comes first. Then everything else is, you know, we are not, uh, or at least like, um, I'm not Elon Musk, so I'm not creating something out of the extraordinary world. So there are some proven practices. So there are all those, uh, you know, methods, you know, like your how to save taxes and like how to run business. Some of those things are already done and proven. But that can be taught and you can like talk to other business owners and people help you. But what's not going to be taught is your own self-confidence and your tenacity that you need to have it within yourself. Yeah, no, that's so true because there's always, you know, someone out there who might, or someone might think, oh, you know, I don't have the confidence to do this. I can't, can't do this. Like you said, that can't be taught. If you need to know what you need to do with your taxes or how to hire someone, or, you know, there's a lot of how to's out there, but, you know, but what I'm hearing you saying is like that, that confidence in yourself and that, you know, just, just keep, just keep going. Right. Because there's going to be you know, in in every business, there's going to be times when you're like, oh, should I keep doing this? Am am I crazy? Right? How many times you ask yourself that? Am I crazy? (laughs) Probably yes, but you keep going anyway. Yes. 
And you have to be crazy, honestly. You have to be a little crazy because, uh, you know, if you're too safe, then then you're doing everything else which has already been done and you're not taking a chance, then what's the point? Then you might as well just work for somebody else or do something which uh, is, is regular. So you do have to be crazy. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you both are crazy because, like, your business yeah. is kind of like, <laughs> you know, real estate and design and, like, you're doing podcasts. So we are 100% crazy. Yeah. When you kept listing off all the things that you do, I was like, oh, she sounds like, a, like you know, our business is, you know, you like the architecture, the design. You know, I, I want to, like, rewind for a second and ask you a little bit more about that envir- uh, environmental oh, yeah. psychology. Psychology, yes. Because yeah. that, to me, is super interesting because, you know, I don't design. I watch Susan do it and I'm always in awe when I see, you know, at the end of the day, when I see the whole thing together, because I'll be asking her questions throughout the process, like, what color is going here? What's this? What's this? And I'm just looking for answers so I can execute, you know, and she's like, I don't know. I can't give you an answer until I'm in the space, you know? So it's always like, you know, she, she has to feel that space and, you know, what does it feel like to her? That's how she, you know, likes to design it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that environmental piece that you were saying. So it's like, because we always joke about how, it's therapy sessions a lot of time with clients, right? Because they're spending a lot of money. You know, it's emotional because it's their home or like you said, their office. It's a place to them that's, you know, they can really resonate with where they can relax and feel like they have a place of solace and comfort, right? So how does that, do you think that that benefits you? I mean, I would think that it would, but the benefit of having that experience and that knowledge, you know, talking to people of that, you know, what does that look like a little bit? Like, how does that help you? you know, as you design and, and listen to people and peel back those layers a little bit. Absolutely. So um, environmental psychology, it's also very scientific and tech, uh, it's very uh, data-based. So when I studied, did my master's, my thesis was actually uh, studying c- how criminals perceive environment before they commit a crime. So like That's a funny, that was my thesis too. <laughs> so funny. We had the same one. <laughs> I knew we I knew we had a connection. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was I mean, I just wanted to point that out so people could know that. So so the basically it's like every human being we when we behave in a certain environment, we pick up on certain cues before we act. So the design of a space can can certain times, of course, it cannot predict anybody's behavior, but it can enable certain behaviors. So my study was basically understanding when you design certain spaces, how human beings perceive it. And human beings could be a different category. You know, like the, the category right now I'm talking about is uh, people who have a very criminal mind, mindset where they want to vandalize a space or they want to do something. So I did a study on a courthouse on how courthouse is the only place where you have criminals, you have the you know common people like us also go to courthouse to do different paperwork. And then you have the people who are like the lawyers and the prosecutors and like, you know, the the uh, the, the, pol- the cops, you know, that th- there are three different groups. And all the three different groups, how they behave in that environment. So that can, so that relates to a lot of other things too. So when you're designing a store, when you're designing a high-end store, you cannot put all these very expensive merchandise behind the shelves and lock everything. You know, like how CVS locks their uh, uh, Gillette shaving cream, and now they've started locking their tie. <laughs> So, so then, but at the same time, your merchandise has to be on display, but you don't want people to pick and walk away. So how right. do you design it so that there is, uh, it's called like the eye. So if pe- the person who wants to pick up the, and run away, he, he's deter- he or she is deterred to do that because the perception is that somebody is watching them. Because if somebody is always watching you, you, you are m- more likely not to commit the crime. So that's mm-hmm. kind of the philosophy. It's called like, I mean, we tested a lot of theories. So there's one particular theory which tested, uh, which we were testing, is called the crime prevention through environmental design. So that's basically like environmental psychology is you have all these different theories of how human beings behave and you test it out and you have like very uh, methodological way of doing it. So you do, uh, you know, you do observations, you tabulate how people are behaving, you do interviews and all that. So that was my thesis and how it relates to my current profession. A lot of this is like when you're doing uh, big mixed use projects, 
and not that we are trying to uh, pr do crime prevention all the time, but yes, that's a very important factor, you know. Uh, we may not be dealing with shoplifters and things like that, but we are dealing with a lot of human beings who want to vandalize a great looking building or something. So how do you design a space which is very comfortable but at the same time, feels very secure. It's more important to feel secure. If you have like 10, uh, 10, 20 cops walking around and it's a beautiful lobby, you won't feel good there. You won't have a cup of coffee there. So, you know, so understanding all that. So after the 9-11, like GSA had um, designed, uh, they had come up with a strategy that all federal buildings, we don't want to feel like we are afraid of terrorists. So we want our federal buildings to look very beautiful very elevated, but at the same time, very secure. So that's called like the transparent security. So that, that trend is still on and you, you know, that's called the invisible security where you are creating these spaces where people feel comfortable. There are more human beings there, but at the same time, they don't feel like somebody's watching them, even though it is very fully secured. You know, somebody cannot attack and run away. And, you know, as we are, you know, living this current scenario, uh, more and more of that strategy is getting implemented in all building types. Earlier it used to be just federal building. Now, you know, schools are going to adapt that. Even, yeah. like, office buildings are going to adapt that. It's like people are now a different type of crime we are noticing. It's like the hate crime or, like, the anger or the frustration. So uh, we cannot, we are not, you know, like this theory doesn't say that we are going to change the criminal world. <laughs> That's right. never going to happen. <laughs> right. I, I, I think I can break this down. I think I can break this down for you. You're creating a safe space where anyone can feel comfortable. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I mean, right. safe in a sense of like comfortable, not so much safe. Like I'm worried I'm going to get robbed, but safe in a sense of when you walk in. You're like, wow, it really feels comfortable here. You know, comfortable, versus... yes. I'm not insecure here. I'm not like watching if somebody is going to come from somewhere and attack me or something. It's like when you meet someone you don't know for the first time, you want to meet in a public space because you feel safer because you're like, okay, I'm surrounded. If I'm meeting someone that's maybe a little crazy. Yes. Um, they're, <laughs> you know, they might, you know, I'm safer because I'm in. That, that makes a lot of sense. It's interesting to take that and... Um, apply it to to the to the design, like you said, you're not looking at, you know, maybe we're going to prevent crime, but creating spaces like that that makes that makes a lot of sense. That's true, though. Everybody just wants to feel good. you feel good, feel safe. It's it's yes. a real mindset thing that you're talking about with too, with you know the successes, you know, and and we try to teach our kids, you know, when you're saying earlier about failing, like you have to fail to succeed. You cannot succeed totally. without failing, and you have to fail multiple times over and over and over and over again, and you're constantly refining your craft tweaking it i always joke and say to susan it's like play-doh when we're doing these projects it's like along the way we're molding it molding it molding it you know because it's um you know you, you you're you might have a plan you know a general plan but then as that space develops that gets tweaked to make it the best that it can be and as you've been you know having that philosophy of you know being confident in yourself and you know, and knowing that, you know, there's going to be some times that you do things and you're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I should do, you know, maybe I should do it this other way instead. Is your interior design firm just so busy that you don't have any time to post on your own social media accounts? Are you at a loss with what to post? Do you have zero strategy? Well, then you need to give us a call. I am so happy with the Wing Not Social. I approached them because I had gotten a content strategy from another PR company and I didn't know what I was doing. And then I approached the Wingnut Social and they prepared a document so carefully with so many details and really just laid out everything for me. They told me how to rename my account what to put in terms of the bio on Instagram, um, what hashtags to use. They analyzed um, my profile, they analyzed my competitors, and they basically told me what to do to increase my following. And it, it worked, you know, and um, I, I'm very thankful. So thank you, Wingnut Social. Go to wingnutsocial.com and hit that Let's Chat button and we can take that all off your plate so you can focus on what it is that you do best. And that's not digital marketing or social media, I'm going to guess, but it's designing for your actual clients. Focus on making that money and let us handle the rest because that's what we do best. 
Give us a call at 786-206-4331 or wingnutsocial.com. Do you have mentors or what has kept you, you know, what has kind of kept you going on, on the path and helping you continue to build your business? Yeah, I do have a lot of mentors and I pick and choose mentors from all walk of life, walks of life. Uh, and I think uh, that's very important. And you may not have just one person who's going to like, that's your parents probably for your entire lifetime. They are your mentors. They're always your well wishers. But, uh, but different people have different strengths and you uh, have to like latch on to them and like reach out to them and say, that, hey, I, you know, I read something about you or I saw this and I really admire this and I would love to know more. And I, the one good thing in my career I have done is that I have not been afraid of reaching out to some of the people when I was a younger designer, some of the people who were at the director level or at a very high level and they were extremely busy to reach out and say, hey, I would love to get a cup of coffee with you and I would love to know like how did you land this project or how did you talk about this design so effortlessly I know the behind the scene was so much, uh, you know, complexity. But when you were talking to the client, you made it sound like a dream for them. And it was such a beautiful, poetic way. How did you do that? So I've never, um, uh, af- and even till this day, like, I mean, not that I'm, uh, you know, I'm definitely much more a seasoned designer now. But yeah. but in terms of business, I'm still, I'm always, my attitude is like, I always think like I'm a sponge and not SpongeBob, but just Sponge. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Paul, probably Patrick. Paul was yeah. thinking about SpongeBob 100%. Probably. You nailed that, yeah. right? But, but who doesn't <laughs> yeah. like SpongeBob, yeah. just for the record? I mean, and who doesn't like him? He's fun, you know. <laughs> but but just like, uh, like, like a kid, I'm always curious. So I reach out to other business owners and I say, okay, you know, like, how are you saving on taxes? Because mm-hmm. I... I, this is a new problem for me. You know, I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure the whole world has figured out, but I haven't. So, t- uh, you know, tell me more about that. Or like business, how do you hire people? How do you, like when you talk to somebody within like three hours, you know, like you have three meetings, let's say, how do you know that this person is a great fit for you unless and until you work with them? So, or like, uh, you know, how did you like uh, achieve this uh, goal of your revenue? Like, was it planned or just like by fluke, some client just, came and he gave you like half a million dollar project what <laughs> happened or like so I I have always been very curious so to answer your question I have mentors in different parts so I have mentors who coach me with business and they are not in design world but they understand money they understand these uh, irritating things which is like accountants uh, you know how, how to deal with accounting like, it's know? perspective right you're getting different perspectives i think all of us find that we love you accountants and we need you but i agree. irritating accountants i mean yes. accountants are <laughs> essential that's what i think you ladies okay. are misunderstanding I think they, they might are essential find... people that we need Yes. No, they are they are very essential. Yes, they might find us crazy people irritating as well, I'm sure. But <laughs> absolutely. Like for creative people, like I, I don't you know, like the or, or the the lawyers and you know, like they're very important very important people. Yes, but for yes. creative we don't want that. And then also like I have mentors who who have actually I have uh, worked under them and I have maintained to, you know, reach out to them periodically and you know, ask them, Okay, this is what I'm doing, I would love to get your feedback and I talk to mm-hmm. them or even if it's just, you know, simple chatting, you learn so much by just talking to people too. Right. And then, of course, my father is my biggest mentor. He's my biggest supporter. And um, he has been a very pivotal part in my career and, and my existence, obviously. So, uh, yeah, so I, I do believe in mentorship. And uh, you don't have to just stick to one mentor. You can have multiples. Yeah, so that's that's a, a great point, right? As you're in business, you're in here, you're a designer, you're, you know, you're in your niche. But when you're in business, there's so much that you have to know. There's so many different things. And there are people out there to help you and not being afraid to ask and being a sponge and just like taking in the information. Um, you know, they always say other people have done this before you don't reinvent the wheel, <laughs> go to them. Most people will help you. And just, you know, taking the step to reach out and ask, you know, it, it, it helps you move faster and, you know, and accomplish more faster because you, instead of trying to figure it out, you have this, you know, this person who says, Hey, I've done this before. Here's what I did that was really messed up. Don't do that. Do that. You know, do this. So there's a lot of value in having the confidence to just go go straight and you know and learn and and 
and find out that information. I, I always say to Susan, when you, you know, when you come across somebody who, you know, knows everything, you know, nobody wants to, to learn from them per se. Right. But when you don't know anything and you're willing to absorb all that information from people, they're willing to tell you process and what they do. And, and that's really incredible. That's like these platforms of, you know, social media, all these things nowadays, like, you know, we wouldn't even be having this conversation with you if it wasn't for things like this. So it's incredible because Susan, I've been very fortunate that we've had some very good mentors in, in our life that have, you know, nudged us maybe in a direction we didn't want to go. You said, you can do this. You know, I think having a coach is totally, um, I think everybody should have a coach because it's, it's accountability, but it's also that reassurance, you know, um, of what you're doing, you're, you're on the right path and so forth. So, you know, I love that you take the mindset of, you know, the design and the space, and then you're also taking into account, like you're really, you know, at the end of the day, design's about listening. That's what that's, and I'm not a good listener typically, so I'm just putting <laughs> that out there, but it's about, you know, Susan is, and it sounds like you are as well, you know, listening to what the people are telling you. Cause you know, if somebody calls us and says their kitchen, you know, they hate their kitchen. That is a typical general answer, right? They, they always don't like something cause it's ugly, but then it's like peeling back. Like they know what they like, but they don't know how to articulate what they actually want. And that's up to you to kind of pull those pieces out and then create that space for them based on that. And it always blows my mind. Yeah, I like always... your dad too. He sounds like me. <laughs> well, <laughs> an inspiration. You know. <laughs> me and him would, would hang out. Definitely. Yes. Tell, him to, tell him to call. Well, he's in India, so you have to travel there. He's so not coming I'm, here. I would definitely go to India and hang with him. That is not a problem. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you've done a lot of amazing things. I love the range of your business. I love that you, you know, that as you are, you know, as you're growing, like, you know, reaching out, learning and, you know, and that's all it is. It's, it's one step at a time and, you know, and staying, staying on that path and, you know, and just kind of learning and, and changing as time goes on. Yeah. That, that sponge mentality, like you said, is huge. You know, learning, Perfect. not SpongeBob, the sponge okay. mentality. Maybe she'll call this the SpongeBob episode. It could we'll be. see. I mean, it's incredible. So you, you sound very similar to Susan where you're very, you know, always learning, trying things and you're getting out of the gate early. You know, she's building houses when she's 20 years old, you know. So um, it sounds like you were doing very similar things, you know. So that is incredible. And that's great that you have the right people throughout your life that push you in that direction to do that. So, you know, sky's the limit, like they say. So at the end of every show, mm -hmm. there's three questions that they ask. Now, I think I messed mine up. Paul still makes fun of me to this day for my answers, but never mind that. It's all going to be fine. We'll so, see. We'll see what her answers are. We'll see are. what your answers mm -hmm. are. So it's three questions you have to answer. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Hashtag cool the seagull. Cool the seagull. Cool the seagull. I think you should give us a no, little. Now, now you have to explain. Yes, it. Yeah. now we want yeah. to listen. So we we were lying. Cool okay. is an English word, so that's like mm -hmm. I'm cool. Desi is basically means Indian, so that but that's a in Hindi word. So yeah. So I'm like a cool Indian girl. So like I love it. Girl. <laughs> Solid. I love that. I like that. You, I like that you gave us the payoff on that because I would have question kept going. I, know, I wonder what like, that meant. <laughs> She was like, no, I really do have to explain it because I know you guys are not going to know. <laughs> yeah, more curiosity would have killed me. <laughs> okay. So the next question is, if you were stuck on a deserted island for the rest of your life and you could only bring one food with you, what would that food be? Uh, the, that would be lentils. 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 That's an excellent choice. Yes. Very practical choice, too. Do you need an explanation for that, too? Why? Why not? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so lentils uh, have very high protein. But they also, they are like almost seeds. So you can save them and store them for years. So if I'm stuck in an island, I can like get like a lot for me to just survive. I can save them under like underground. So they don't need like special uh, or like, uh, yeah, they have to be stored in some place and they will just last for years. And then every time I want to eat something, I can just like just boil the lentils and like maybe add some local flavor. And I have full protein, so I, I'm not hunting. I'm, I, you know, I have these lentils, and they can regrow. I can create sprouts, and I can re regrow them. So if I'm stuck on an Process. island, I'm going with her. I'm yes. just but that's what I was just going to say. If you asked me, I'd be like, pizza, and there'd be no explanation. You have a full-blown thesis on why just you would have lentils, which is incredible. That's, that's amazing. We would you, all die. You're like, I can replant would... them. They'll last forever. Like, I love how you thought out 
so far in advance being on yes. the island for so long. Because I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. So. <laughs> that is incredible. I love it. The last question is, can you please recommend a book that has impacted you personally or professionally? Mm -hmm. Yes, the one book I absolutely loved when this is before I started my business is Onward by uh, the, the CEO of um, uh, Starbucks, Howard. Was his, I forgot his last name. I should not forget his last name. But yeah, Onward. Uh, it's a book written on Starbucks and how he started, how he thought of the idea, the branding behind it, how the Starbucks uh, company itself, when it was at the peak, how they were uh, dropping their, you know, their business model has shifted a little bit and how the sales were dropping and how he steps back in and how he projects, uh, like how he rails the, uh, the business back in and how, how Starbucks is today. So that's a great journey uh, to, because before Starbucks, there was no, like no brand like, like theirs around just coffee. Like if you think about it, it's just coffee. Uh, but then the the whole philosophy and the importance of branding, importance of understanding what your business core values are, and then just sticking to that and not diverting. So I think that was a very important uh, book for me. Uh, I'm going to add a bonus question in this round. I'm going to ask a bonus question in this round. The, the, this isn't one Dala has. This is one I have. <laughs> this is my own little spin on this. Uh -oh. So if you could give me one word that describes your style, brand, what would that be? So it's actually the company's name, Asaya. So Asaya is a Sanskrit word which translates to the uh, philosophy of cradle of feelings and thoughts. And that's what the design philosophy is. If we are about not only just creating like beautiful spaces, but it's about understanding the feelings of what the organization is or the human being is, and also being thoughtful about it. So that's, it's, it's not a word, but it's a phrase. Well, it's a word. It's Asaya. And the meaning of that is the cradle of feelings and thoughts. I, I you're making me want to go meditate right now. <laughs> yeah, I he really, wants to be. I, do, I actually do yoga. I like yoga. I love, I, I love yoga. I'm actually pretty good at it too. You, said, you have sent him away yes, to yoga. That's I'm, it. You've done it. Wow. I'm going to a different place right now. And well, it's Asaya. <laughs> It's been awesome talking to you. Where can yes. people find you? Where yeah, how do we? How do people find all your stuff? How do they get to see all the fun things that you're doing? Cool. So um, we have a website. It's uh, in, in nothing different. It's www.asiadesign.com, and we try to regularly post our projects, uh, upcoming projects, past projects. Uh, we are on social media as well, so we may not be hyperactive like everybody else, but Asaya Design has its own handle, and then um, we are very active in LinkedIn as well. So, like you know, posting business-wise too, like what, how is design impacting businesses, and how we are trying to do a little bit. Uh, so, very, um, very active in uh, LinkedIn, and same name, Asaya Design. Or you can follow me. Uh, I'm Smita Sahu, so my handle is Smita Six Seven Nine. And on LinkedIn, I'm Smith Asahu. So, or you can just Google me. <laughs> I love it. I love, love it. it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was yes. so awesome talking very to insightful. you. Very insightful. Love it. It's all very, very, very fun spiritual meaning to me. You know, <laughs> spiritual. I've become a much deeper person because of this <laughs> podcast. I, I just want to crazy. let you know. I just want to let you know. My spirit animals out there at the window of looking on a beautiful creature. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Absolutely. That was such a fun conversation with Smitha. She had a lot to share, a lot of good insights and super interesting some of the, you know, some of the things that she's doing. Yeah, I would have never thought about, you know, the uh, environmental psychology tying into the design itself. So that was super insightful for me. And I feel like I am more at peace with myself now because of that. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with Paul, but <laughs> you can find us on social everywhere. Our handle is Cadillac Homes, and that's Cadillac with two Ks, K-A-D-I-L-A-K. -A -A um, and you can catch our home renovation show on our app, Renovation Rekindle, and that can be downloaded on any app store. Don't forget to check out Wingnut Social at wingnutsocial.com and get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. <laughs>